if you have already been baptised, it's still a good refresher for us all to remember why baptism is important, but most importantly, what it represents in your life and your life after baptism. Because baptism is really just a point in your life. As we're going to see tonight, it doesn't change you physically. There's no magical thing that happens when you are baptised. Now, most Christians would have heard of baptism. Baptism, in some ways, is synonymous with Christianity. And baptism is often associated with a conversion to Christianity. And I guess our subject tonight is, when should you be baptised? At what age? At what level of maturity? And if you look around in the churches, whether it be Catholic or Anglican, most churches now, adult baptism has been lost. It's been lost to rituals such as infant sprinkling. And we'll see tonight that, in particular, infant sprinkling is not found in the Bible at all. And we want to consider tonight, really, what the Bible says on this subject and what God has determined the act at which we can really pinpoint in our life that we turned our hearts to God. And I believe that baptism is that point that God has determined uh, for us to make a physical and spiritual commitment. So we want to try to answer some questions tonight. And hopefully we can answer some of these. First one, why baptism? I want to briefly consider what it is. What does it mean to be baptised? And as part of that, why is full immersion important? And we want to have a look at the precedent of baptism in the Old Testament. So before the command that Christ gives to be baptised in Mark 16, is there a precedent for a full immersion or baptism in the Old Testament? And then we want to answer why adult baptism? Obviously our title tonight strongly suggests what we as Christadelphians believe on this subject. So why do we believe in adult baptism? Why can't a baby just have its head sprinkled? Or why can't you know, a one-year-old uh, be dunked underwater for a few seconds? We want to briefly consider as well what happens if you die before you're baptised? Can you be baptised twice? Are you automatically saved once you're baptised? And most importantly, what is required after baptism? So hopefully in some way we can answer most of those questions tonight. Well first, what is baptism? And the first place we go these days to get a definition of anything is to Google. So if you type what is baptism into Google, this is the answer that it gives. It is the Christian religious rite of sprinkling water on a person's forehead or of immersing them in water, symbolising purification or regeneration and admission to the Christian church. In many dominations, baptism is performed on young children and is accompanied by name-giving. So a lot of those things we've already highlighted are wrong. And we're going to see why sprinkling of water on a person's forehead is not really baptism. And we're going to see why performing baptism on young children is not biblical at all. We know by definition that baptism is a full immersion. Because if we look at the word in the Bible, it's this Greek word. Um, well, the Greek word is uh, baptismo. Oh, no, sorry. Baptizo. Um, and that word baptizo is derived from the Greek word bapto. And this Greek word bapto, by very definition, means to cover wholly with a fluid. And when would you cover something wholly in a fluid? Well, if you wanted to stain something or to dye something, to change the colour of something completely, 
you would have to baptise it in the dye. Now, if you try that in your backyard with um, you know, just some clean water and you put a white shirt into it, it's obviously going to be baptised, but it's not going to be changed, is it? You're going to bring it out, it's going to be a bit wet. So what you could do is take something, put some dye in the water, dunk it in the water, and then when it comes out, it's completely transformed into something else. That's an example of uh, artificial intelligence doing that for me. That was a bit of a test. Um, see how that worked. It didn't work that well. It doesn't really look like the same thing. But that's the point, actually. When you baptise something, it's completely transformed when it comes out. It doesn't look like the same thing anymore. And if you just briefly come across a few pages, seems we're in Romans 6 already, if you come across to Romans chapter 12, a different word, but a similar concept. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we read there, to be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may have, sorry, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that word there for transformed, does anyone know what that, the Greek word for that is? Yes. Well, that's not the Greek word, but metamorpho, I think. Yeah. So that's it, Annie. So. What is metamorphosis? Like, what's an example of metamorphosis? Any? A butterfly. So, what does the butterfly start out as? A caterpillar. So, a, gr a caterpillar and a butterfly are just completely different. You can't even, you wouldn't even know that a butterfly came from a caterpillar unless you watched it physically transform before your eyes as it comes out of the cocoon. So, that same concept is used by Paul here to show us. What, what is required in baptism? Like he says here, it's this physical change, sure. You see the physical change of the butterfly, but he's relating it here to a renewing of the mind. Because when someone goes under the water and comes out, really they're just a wet version of their self. But what God really wants is a change of your mind, a change of your thinking. And that's what we just looked at there in Romans chapter 6. And we're going to come and deal a bit more with that changing of the mind shortly. So, why then is a full immersion necessary? Why is that required? Well, water in the Bible and water in our life is essential for many tasks. And specifically, it's used for washing. And in the Bible, water is a symbol of purification. To wash in water is used throughout the Bible as an act that cleanses all types of uncleanness. And if you come with me for a second to Numbers chapter 19. We have in Numbers chapter 19, God using water to cleanse someone that was made unclean by the touching of a dead body. And it's an interesting section. And we're just going to read um, from verse 11 here in Numbers chapter 19. It says, He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. Now, we know in modern times, if you touch a dead body, you know, you, if they've been dead a long time, you might have I mean, some dead skin cells or something, I don't know, like it, it's not going to kill you. Um, so there's probably no need really, unless you go, you could, we'll go wash your hands maybe under the tap. But in our modern understanding, there probably would be no need to wash your whole body. So just keep that in mind as we go through here. Verse 12, so if that person, he shall purify himself with it on the third day. So three days after touching that dead body, he is to purify himself. And on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify himself, not himself on the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. So you can see here that God sets forth this ritual that whoever has touched the dead body must go through to be clean. And we're going to read sort of the finer detail of that ritual now. Verse 13. Whoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of Yahweh, of the Lord, 
And that soul shall be cut off from his uh, cut off from Israel, because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him, and he shall be unclean, and his uncleanness is yet upon him. So we can see here introduction of sprinkling, which is quite interesting. And we're going to deal with that in a second. Verse 14. This is the law. When a man dieth in a tent, all that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields or a dead body or a bone of a man or, of, or a grave shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin. And running water shall be put therein into a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and all the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touches the bone of one slain, of one dead or of a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and he shall be clean at even. So you'll notice here, as we said, that sprinkling is used on the third day. And also the objects, as well as the people, are sprinkled. However, the person who touched the dead body is not fully cleansed until the seventh day, when he bathes in water. And that word bathe there means to wash the whole. In this context, it means a complete immersion. And this idea of ritualistic bathing is not only used here in this part of the law, but in many contexts throughout the Bible, and especially throughout the law. And it's performed mainly in major events, such as marriage, such as conversion, and entry into the priesthood. And still in Israel today, and many of the Jewish customs today, baptism is a major part of the Jewish religion. And most synagogues these days will actually have a baptismal bath built into the synagogue. And the Jews have a ritual called the, the tevela, which in Hebrew is a full immersion. And they immerse themselves in what's called a, a mikvah. And a mikvah is a pool of natural water in which one bathes for the restoration of ritual purity. So although in symbol here, Someone that is unclean needs to fully immerse themselves in water to be cleansed of that symbolic uncleanness. It's showing us the principle that a full immersion is needed to fully purify our whole body. And it's just interesting how this principle was set in the minds of the Jewish people so early on in their history. And it still continues today. And uh, there's a picture of a mikveh um, in a synagogue. So that was actually one off the internet. Uh, before I realized, I actually had some of my own pictures of mikvehs. So here is a synagogue. Has anyone actually been here? Does anyone recognize that? Uh, it's a synagogue in the Golan Heights. Um, in a place in northern Israel called Hamat Gadar, uh, near the Yakumuk River, near the Sea of Galilee. And that's the synagogue. Um, apparently there's a lot of hot springs near here, and there's a Jewish settlement, and if you had some sort of disease, you'd come up here for, for healing. And this is the synagogue in the community. And that's the entrance to the synagogue. Oops. And just right next to the synagogue is their mikveh. And it's interesting that a lot of these mikvahs have a very similar design. They've got these steps that go down into this pool. And they've kept that design, uh, interestingly, down through the thousands of years of their history. Um, this is an, another mikvah. Um, sorry, this is another synagogue um, that also has a mikvah. And this synagogue is, does anyone recognize this one? This one's probably more famous. Um, in Chorazin, um, near Galilee as well. And... That's their mikvah, quite a big one. Um, but obviously you can see it still holds water. Probably quite a bit of silt at the bottom of that. I would, probably wouldn't bathe in that. But that is uh, the body of standing water that they would have bathed in. And this is 
a modern mikveh. You can see they've completely copied the, the style. This is um, in a, a synagogue in uh, New York at uh, the Aish Kodesh synagogue. So still today, um, they had bars like this so that full immersions can happen so that they can f fulfill their cleansing rituals. So when we come to the New Testament then, even before Christ is revealed to the world, we have John the Baptist baptizing. So if you come across to Matthew chapter 3, we have here in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist. And it calls him that in verse 1 of chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out, of, out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. It's quite amazing here that John had taken this ritual of baptism and he was using it, as it says here, to prepare the people for the coming of their Messiah. He was preparing them by helping them realize that they had strayed, they had strayed from God, and that baptism could be used to cleanse them of those sins. It's used here, as he says, to give people an opportunity to confess their sins. So that might make an outward display to God of a change that was happening internally. And if you come now to our reading for tonight, Romans chapter 6, we'll see the process internally of what happens. It says, Know ye not, verse 3 of Romans chapter 6, that so many of us that were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. So when we are baptized, being fully immersed in the water is symbolizing our death. You're going under the water as, as you would go under the ground when you died. So we're baptized into his death. We're putting to death our mortal body. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, when we come out of that water, just as Christ was raised, he was resurrected, when we come out of that water, we should walk in newness of life. And it continues that language in verse 5. We've been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. It's good to pick up on the terminology here because it continues throughout the New Testament. The old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Like we saw in Matthew, when John was baptizing, you are to confess your sins. You're actually, this is a point in your life you're saying, I don't want to be that old person anymore. We're putting to death the old man. And we're choosing a new path in life. Like the, the caterpillar before, we've been transformed into a new person. This is a new, we're a different person, completely changed. Verse 6 again, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. This is the purpose of baptism. The purpose of baptism is to give you an opportunity to publicly confess that you're changing your life. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. When you've made that choice to change your life, you're freed from that way of life. You now have a, a new opportunity to walk in a different way of life. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also 
that we shall also live with him. And that's the hope. That's the hope that resurrection, sorry, that baptism gives you. That you can live a new life like Christ was resurrected and given new life. He is in heaven with God now. We also have opportunities to be given new life. Eternal life. If we choose to walk, to follow in the footsteps that Christ has given us to follow. What matters, verse 4, that we just read, is that after baptism, we walk in newness of life. By being baptised, that old person that you are is crucified like Christ was crucified. The old body was sinful, but the new body coming out of the water, like Christ coming out of the grave, gives us that new opportunity to live uprightly. If you come across to Ephesians chapter 4, Being baptised means a change in the way you want to live your life. It's a declaration to God that you want to dedicate your life to him and living according to how he has prescribed in the Bible. And of course, you need to have an understanding of what God requires of you. And if it isn't obvious before now, baptism, the way that we've described it, is not really possible for a baby. A baby like the one that's just being led out to the back now probably doesn't really want to change her ways. Her ways are quite convenient to her currently. And it's not really until you reach a mature age that you realise that the selfish path that your life has been led by up until that point in time is not the way that God prescribes in the Bible. And if we read here Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. We're born with human nature. And that human nature is amoral in a lot of ways. It's carnal. It thinks like an animal does. It lives by its lusts. And it's not until morals are injected into us and morals come from this book, the Bible. Until those morals affect us, until our mind is renewed, verse 23, be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. Until that change happens, then you are really living by your lusts. Verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Putting away lying. Um, Putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labour, working with his hands, the thing that is good, that he may be able to give to him that needeth. Let not corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. These things are not natural to us as human beings. These ways of life, ways of living life, ways of treating our neighbour, ways of treating our fellow human beings is not natural. If you go out into most major cities or any city at night. These type of behaviours is not how people act. Even in the daylight, this is not how we act. In our workplaces, wherever we may be. Our our world is full of corrupt communication. It's full of stealing. It's full of angry people. It's full of people not working with their hands. So, in your mind... When do you think someone would be capable of making the decision to live a life like this rather than the natural way our mind works? When do you think someone is capable of making that decision? And for everyone, it's different. I titled tonight suggested you needed to be an adult to make that decision. And maybe that's early in life. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it says, 
that when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised both men and women. That really is the only indication we have of how old people were when they were baptised. And we know in certain cultures, people turn into men a lot sooner. In the Jewish culture, you, you become a man when you're 13. But we know that a baby cannot understand. They cannot understand to believe the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. You could be 13 and understand that and be baptised. But you're probably not going to be five. You're probably going to struggle to understand it fully and the change that needs to happen in your life before maybe early to late teenager. And come across with me now to, or back with me to Acts chapter 19, where Paul comes across some disciples of John in Corinth. And we're going to answer another one of our questions now of can you be baptised twice? Because, interestingly, these disciples, Acts chapter 19, verse 1, that Paul comes across, had already been baptised. For this one, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Spirit since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard as there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Unto them what were ye baptised? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now John's baptism was a baptism to repentance. As it says, John verily baptised with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ, um, Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because in John's baptism, he was asking them to confess their sins. But like we read in Acts chapter 8, you need to understand as well the things concerning not only the kingdom of God, which John could preach about, but the name of Jesus Christ. That also is essential to be able to follow. And Jesus Christ is the essential element to why baptism can save you. And if we look over again now, um, same uh, chapter in verse 7. It says that all the men that were baptised at this time were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So these twelve men that were baptised for the second time here, they were baptised by John, they then come to understand that Jesus Christ was an essential part of that. And now Paul fully persuades them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. So these two essential elements, the name of Jesus Christ and the things concerning the kingdom of God, are the two things that need to be fully grasped before baptism can happen. And that combination is mentioned throughout Acts and throughout the, um, the Gospels and throughout the letters that Paul and others wrote. They preached the kingdom of God and the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. And that was actually Christ's last words to his disciples. If you turn to Mark chapter 16, he tells them to go into all the world. Mark 16. And this is what they were to preach. Verse 15. He said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel, we don't have fully time to go into tonight, is the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to preach that to every creature. So if you're able to comprehend those two things, of what those two things fully um, represent, and what those two things mean for you, then you can be baptised. And he says, verse 16, he that believeth on those things, you have to be able to comprehend it, and believe it. If you can do that, then you'll be saved. But he that believeth not uh, shall be damned or condemned. So as we've seen, 
Being baptised is a decision to put to death the natural man. Put to death everything that is earthly, everything that is sensual, everything that is self-serving. And that is a very difficult thing to do, as we all know. Considering that this body that we live in is prone to that way of thinking. It takes a determined effort to set your affection on God and to allow Him to work in your life. Being baptised means that you need to consider your old life dead and gone. It's been buried. And now your life is hid in Christ. You now no longer want anything out of this life, but you wait the time when Christ will appear and He will restore your life forever. And that is the message of Colossians chapter 3. If you just want to turn there with me now. Colossians chapter 3 uses similar language to what we read in Romans. But I feel it gives a deeper understanding of what our life needs to be, what our life needs to change to once we're baptised. We'll read verse 1 to 4 here. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. You have put yourself to death in baptism. And now your life is hid with Christ in God. And with, when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. He goes on in verse 5. That after your baptism, although you've put that man to death, you're going to continue to struggle against that old man who's going to be trying to raise himself up again. Verse 5, he says... That we need to put your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness. This is the things they're going to struggle with, says Paul. These are the things that are going to continue to crop up in your life. And of course, they can be depraved as fornication. All sorts of uncleanness. Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, basically lusting after anything that God has forbidden, covetousness. We all struggle with one of those things, or many of them. A babe cannot understand how to avoid those things. Maybe even a young teenager might not understand what those things mean. So we had to make a decision to be baptized to turn from those things. You need an understanding of what your flesh is capable of and how to prevent those things from happening in your life, asking obviously for God's help. And although these things can be learnt after baptism, I personally believe that someone who has purposed in their heart to change their ways, to put off the old man, before they've taken the step to be baptised, they need to be someone that can understand what it requires, what life in Christ requires. Because verse 5 there said, mortify your members which are upon the earth, all of these things. You need to have the skills to mortify those things. And much of the evil that we commit as humans comes out of our mouth. These two need to be put off at baptism. Anger Which one of us hasn't shown anger? Similarly, wrath. Malice, which is all types of bad things, basically, and depravity. Blasphemy, speaking those things that are offensive to God. And I find it interesting that the last things in both of these lists, covetousness and lying, probably the two things that we all struggle with the most. And it's like Paul is just putting these depraved things at the top, like, oh yeah, I can tick that off, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, oh wait, do a lot of that. (laughs) And it seems to a logical observer that an adequate knowledge of God, 
and what God's principles are and what he wants of us is required but to live a life that he wants us to after baptism. And so we can also conclude that salvation really is not dependent on you going under the water. Because as we said, that doesn't change you. You just come out a little wetter than what you were before. Baptism is a transformation. You need to transform your life from those things. And that doesn't happen overnight. That process should begin before baptism and continues after baptism. It's a process of putting off. And then it's a process of putting on. We have to put on the new man. As it says, which is renewed in knowledge after him that created him. Now we were made in the image of God in Genesis at the creation. We were made in the physical image of God. But we also have the moral capability to be the image of God internally. And that's what we are encouraged to do. Life after, after baptism is a process of filling up the vessel that has been emptied, renewing it with the contents of knowledge and endeavouring to become the image of Christ because Christ was the image of God. And it's for this purpose, really, that God has even put mankind on this earth, that we might become the image of him, to develop in us his character, that we might be the outward, but also, more importantly, the inward image of him. And this process takes time, and baptism is the beginning of that journey. But you can only begin that journey once you can count the cost, once you understood what is required of you, once that you can understand the prize of eternal life that is offered to you. And Christ speaks of this in Luke chapter 14. Just um, come over there for a moment with me. Paul, sorry, um, Christ explains to the multitude that life as a disciple is not easy. Life as a disciple of Christ, you need to count the cost. Verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Was happy after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it all that began it begin to mock him, saying that man began to build and was not able to finish. We need to count the cost of being a disciple in Christ. All those that come to Christ need to understand the choice that faces them. Sure, the reward is great, and that reward that we are promised far outweighs the, that cost. But it's still a calculation that needs to be made. And the point I'm trying to make is, can a child or a babe give due consideration to that? I put it to you that only someone who has the facts before them, someone that can truly count the cost to themselves and to their families, are able to make it. And we are given encouragement in Second Chronicles, sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 4. For our light affliction of this life, it's but for a moment, Paul says, and it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not to the things which are seen, but to the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Those who choose the path laid out in the Bible will live an amazing life. No more do you need to care about the things of this life. To keep up with those around you in material and physical manifestations of success. Those people will have different goals. And the prime goal that we have to those who wish to be baptised is to develop into the image of Christ, to develop and display the character of God and showing mercy, kindness, humbleness. That's what um, Paul goes on to say in Colossians that we don't have time fully to deal with. But developing these characteristics putting these things on. Like as it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, for as many as you have been baptised into Christ 
have put on Christ, have put on these characteristics. Well, I hope we've been able to show tonight that baptism is the most important choice that you can make in your life. It's not one that can be taken lightly or at an age where you might not understand all the ramifications or responsibilities. But it's a choice that God has given us of our own free will that we might begin a journey of discovery of who God is and how we can develop into his image.